ルズのニューシングルウルフルズのニューシングルハローファイトファンズ and welcome back to Pride Resurrection, a historical video series dedicated to the Pride Fighting Championships, where with each episode we'll take a look back at a specific event from Pride's history. And today, dear viewers, we'll be taking a look back at Pride 25. I am the most dangerous man alive today, here to bring you all the action, the history, the facts. Buckle up, boys, we've got a big show today. The year is 2003. Japan. A drug is sweeping the land. A drug called Blow. Users of the drug find themselves with increased energy, stamina, and charisma. It becomes all the rage in dojos across Japan. Everyone suddenly has so much to say. But there is one dojo which has refused to take part, and its fighters have vowed to never try it, despite how cool it is. Soon they begin to get mocked by the dojo across the street where all the fighters are on blow. They think they're so cool, and so they challenge the dorky dojo to a fight. Eight of the best warriors from the clean dojo will take on eight of the coolest, most talkative fighters from the blow dojo, and a battle for the soul of a nation will be fought. This is Pride 25! Body blow. Held on March 16, 2003, at the Yokohama Arena in Yokohama, Japan, Pride 25 features eight bouts of extreme body blowing action. 2002 was in the rear view mirror, and this is Pride's first event of the year 2003. Over 19,000 Japanese yokels have packed the Yokohama Arena for their festivities, and Steven Quadros and Boss Rutten have returned to provide commentary. We'll see the return of many. Old and new faves, including Akira Soji, Alex Stiebling, Carlos Newton, Anderson Silva, Dan Henderson, Rampage Jackson, Kevin Randleman, Minotaur Noguera, and his little brother, Fedor, and even Kazushi Sakuraba. What more could you ask for? Before we get into our event, what else was happening in the MMA world around this time? About one week prior to Pride 25, the Deep promotion held Deep, Eighth Impact on March 8th. 2003 at the Karakuen Hall in Tokyo, Japan. Actually, I don't even want to talk about this event, as every name on the card will have you scratching your head and shouting, Who? And nearly every single fight went to a decision or a draw. It's really bad. Instead, let's talk about Pancrase Hybrid 3, held on the same day as the Deep event, March 8th. Pancrase was in decline around this time, and this event was fairly sparse, featuring only a couple notable names, such as Jason Godsey, Kazao Misaki, and Yuki Kondo. It was headlined by a middleweight championship bout of Izuru Takeuchi taking on the champ, a very young and slim Nate Marquardt. This was before the horse meat diet. Nate KO'd poor Azuru after 1 minute and 29 seconds of the first round. Well, with all that out of the way, let's get into it. It's Pride 25 Body Blow. Wow, Boss Rutten punches Steven Quadros right in the nads. Quadros, no worse for wear, sports some freshly conditioned hair. He informs us that Boss isn't wearing any old gloves. They are the official Pride Fighting Championships gloves. And when you have them on, you know you have made it to the top of the mixed martial arts world. This segues into the event breakdown, where first the main event, Nogueira vs. Fedor, is previewed, then they cover the big return of Sakuraba. Quadros then delivers a pretty slick hook. Next, they cover Randleman vs. Rampage, where it's announced the winner gets to face the most dangerous man in MMA. No, 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 not me. That would be Vanderlei Silva for the middleweight title. Also, what is up with the Silva faces all over the screen? The intro ends with, you guessed it, some cheeky nonsense. And the fade to black choice was a little odd, I will admit. Next, we are taken straight into the pre fight for the first fight of the evening, which is Little Noguera, that's Rogerio, taking on a newcomer named Kazahiro. In the pre fight, Boss tells us it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu versus Judo. Boss says he thinks Noguera's boxing will be better, but only because he doesn't know anything about Kazahiro. Good reasoning, Boss. It's off to the ring, no parade of fighters included on our DVD rip. 
What a shame. This is a middleweight bout, which for Pride was 205 pounds. Rogerio was 26 years old here, and his record was 5-1. and one. Kazahiro from Japan was 23 years old, and this was his pro MMA debut. We last saw Rogerio at the previous Pride, Pride 24, Cold Fury 3, where he beat the venerable guy Mesger by a split decision and sent him packing for good. Rogerio returns here at Pride 25 to take on a new and debuting Kazuhiro Nakamura, who, as we can see, has entered the ring in a traditional judo gi. Hmm, but just who is this new Japanese face, you ask? Born in Fukuyama, Japan, Kazuhiro began training judo at the age of 10, training under the former judo world champion Katsuhiko Kashiwazaki. Kazuhiro's biggest judo achievement was placing third in the 100-plus kilo division of the Japanese championships. In 2002, Kazuhiro would give up the judo dream when he joined the Yoshida Dojo, named for Hirohiko Yoshida, where he would begin training MMA. And uh, that's all I can tell you about out Kazuhiro. We get our little spastic shrunken ring announcer for this one, and he is my favorite pride ring announcer, though I couldn't tell you what the hell his name is. <laughs> Nakamura has his coach Yoshida and Shuyoshi Kosaka in his corner. Meanwhile, in Nogueira's corner, he has some fun boys of the Brazilian top team, including Mario Sperry and Murillo Bustamante. It's clearly a jab versus Brazilian affair in this one. Quadro says that Yoshida has become a national hero in Japan after his totally legit armbar victory over Don Fry at Pride 23. At the stare down, we see a big height difference between the men. Quadro says it's four inches, with Nogueira being 6'3", and laughably, Nakamura is said to be 5'10". I don't believe it for a second. He might be 5'8 on a good day. And according to Quadros, Nakamura actually outweighs Rogerio by 10 pounds, which doesn't make any sense at all. Right before the bell, Nakamura chickens out and takes off the gi. I smell something, man. You smell something? I definitely smell something in my hair. I smell, I smell, I smell, I smell pussy. Yo, he's a pussy, man. It's time for the fight, round one. After about 10 seconds of feeling out, oh boy, there he goes. Nakamura tries to grab Nogueira and eats a knee. They wrestle for a position, another knee up the pipe from Nogueira. Kazuhiro, with over-under, manages to secure a lock and shockingly picks up and slams Nogueira. The crowd loves it. Where he wants to be, he's got half a body lock on Nogueira with the left underhook. Nice big down here. Now that's some serious judo without a gi. Short-lived groundwork as Nakamura is already up on his feet. Two leg kicks. After another leg kick, Nakamura dives in for a punch, which looked pretty good. On the ground, missed armbar in the ropes by Nogueira. Back in guard, Nogueira is already trying for a triangle, but Nakamura defends well and slips out. But he slips into maybe an Oma Plata attempt. Active work from the bottom by Nogueira. Though Nogueira tries to hang on to Nakamura, he slips out and is on his feet. Nogueira is brought back up to his feet as well. I criticized Rogerio's boxing in the last episode. Episode, and I will admit it looks slightly improved here. Heck, even he acknowledges his boxing improvement with this little gesture right here. Nakamura weaves in again. They crisscross the ring and Nakamura is deflected away. Another attempt by Nakamura is stuffed easily. Then he eats a knee on his lazy clinch attempt. Nakamura manages to dodge Nogueira's punch. He's stuffed low and then pushed onto his back. Nogueira is on top. Five minutes down, Nogueira is in half guard and lands some punches to the gut inside of Nakamura. And then whoop! Nakamura power bridges and manages to turn and flip Nogueira, who immediately goes for a heel, and Nakamura bails, stands and leaves Nogueira on the mat. Nakamura toys with the foot, and that sneaky little bastard slips in the right and gets locked in guard. Baby punches from Nakamura leads to a near omoplata, but Nakamura squeaks away. Up kick from Nogueira, and Nakamura is standing once again. Nakamura has gotten back down in guard and finds himself trapped, but nice little lift and drop. Breaks him free. Three minutes left now in round one. Nogueira is like a young girl in springtime, skipping and kicking away. Then he clocks Nakamura in the head with a push kick. Nogueira is going for a triangle, but Nakamura is not in the right position for it, and so he gives up. Ref reposition after a 30-second lull. Not much time remaining in our round, though. We get some Atsuka-esque baby punches from Nakamura. Really impressive stuff. Boss takes the piss and calls these hammer fists. Little ones. Some 
Amber fists, little ones. Nakamura is back on his feet. The ref stands up, Nogueira. Then on the restart, Nogueira punches. Nakamura dives, and the bell rings, ending our first round. Nogueira definitely did more during that round. He was always on the attack. Nakamura landed some okay shots, and he had some good escapes. And here's a bit of advice, guys. Find a man that will rub your thighs like Mario Sperry. Time for round two. Nogueira started the round with a solid leg kick, and he should focus more on that because his boxing, uh, it's still kind of shit. Weak shoot attempt by Nakamura leads to him giving up completely and giving Nogueira his back, but he rolls nicely, but he loses control and winds up in guard. Nakamura is up to his feet, and the ref is in quickly to stand up Nogueira. Do you think that Nakamura is going to try and throw a bomb out of the, you know, like unexpected right here? <laughs> Another shot attempt from Nakamura, but Lanky Nogueira easily sprawls out and he's on top. Nogueira tries to smite Nakamura to little avail. As the fighters slink into the ropes, Nogueira delivers some solid shots. Nogueira keeps it up, and though Nakamura pushes him away, he doesn't follow up, and Nogueira calmly crawls back in to get him some more. Two minutes left, Nakamura looks cooked. He's saved briefly by a ref restart, but man, he is finished. Right after the restart, Nakamura seems to have given up trying, and he allows Nogueira to take his back and eat some punches. And if you guessed Rear Naked Choco is coming, aha! Wrong! Arm bar! That's it, viewers. I think we found the running gag for this episode. Antonio Rogerio Noguera, winner via armbar at 3 minutes 30 seconds of the first round. The fun boys of Brazil celebrate Nakamura takes the walk of shame, and we're off to the next fight. Well, this was a bit of a grind, but an interesting grappling match. I didn't give Nakamura much of a chance, but he did better than I expected. But hard to beat a Noguera from this era in grappling. Noguera looked... Eh, he looked okay. Overall, I give this fight a 6 out of 10. Deep Analysis with Alistair. Hello everybody, it is I, Alistair, Master of Gentleman's Combat and purveyor of the deepest possible analysis. And I am here to talk to you about Pride Body Blow. Uh, I will start from the very beginning. Here we have Lil Nog taking on Kazuhiro Nakamura. This was another kind of conservative fight from our man uh, Lil Nog, however it was good work from the inexperienced Kazuhiro Nakamura. Uh, nice judo throws, nice grappling, but he lacked the stand-up skills to hang with the Olympic boxing trained uh, Lil Nog, and, and he gassed super hard. Uh, the armbar from the back from Lil Nog was in fact really nice, and very judo style, so... Our man Kazuhiro Nakamura lived by judo and then died by off-brand Brazilian judo. Ah, uh, good fight. So, what would become of our two night crawling crawlers here? We'll see Nakamura return first at the very first Pride Bushido show held in October of 2003. There he takes on a low-rent Gracie. Daniel Gracie. As for Rogerio, he returns later on in December for Pride Shockwave 2003, where he takes on Kazushi Sakuraba. Whoa, see you boys then! The second fight of the evening is a middleweight bout. Seeing a returning Akira Soji taking on a returning Alex Stiebling. Akira was 29 years old for this bout and his record was 9, 8, and 5. As for Stiebling, he was 26 years old and his MMA record was 12, 4, 1, and 1 no contest. Backstage, Quadros interviews Stiebling, who's sporting blonde hair with dark bluish top. He looks a bit clownish, but at least he's matched his shirt's dark blue hue. He's also sporting two previously blackened eyes, which are just about healed. Not a good look when someone kicks your ass in training. Straight out, Quadros asks Stiebling if he's still the Brazilian killer. Are you still the Brazilian killer? I'm, I'm still 6-1 and one against Brazilians. I'm not, I'm, you know, I got split. That's fine, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a better fighter for it. Quadros not satisfied with that response demands an answer. Back to my question, uh, are you still the Brazilian killer? <laughs> Actually, I got dubbed a new nickname. Because uh, <laughs> after every every night of training, you know, we trade really hard and I'd come in, plop down on the couch and uh, stick my hand in my pants like so and throw on, use the remote and so I got dubbed the, the, uh, the fighting Al Bundy. 
Boss knows a lot about Alex, as Alex had trained with Boss for about a month, and then Alex called up one of Boss's students, Amir Ranavardi. Remember him? Amir went to train with Alex, and Alex apparently could go 20 minutes full steam with no problem. Then there's another bit from the backstage interview. Alex thinks if he beats Soji, he should get another fight, and he's keen on fighting some of the shoot box guys. Quadros also wants to know what's the most annoying thing a ref can say during a fight. Alex, give up! Alex, give up! Alex, give up! Then he says actually the most annoying thing is when a doctor tells him the fight is over and he looks up at the 40 foot screen and sees a gaping hole in his eye. Gotta give it to him, Alex is a very likable doof. Next we are treated to Soji's entrance and Boss is still calling him a small Igor Volchanchin. The small Igor Volchanchin, although his body fat has been reduced <laughs> a lot lately so... Soji has Matt Hume in his corner, and he apparently went out to the northwest of America to train with him. He's looking pretty thin, too. Soji, that is. We last saw Soji at Pride 22 in September of 2002, which was also his most recent fight. There he lost via... Armbar! To Paulo Filho. As for Alex, we last saw him at Pride 21 in June 2002. There he lost via TKO to Anderson Silva. Since then, he's had two fights. First against Yuki Sasaki at the Pancreas 2002 anniversary show in September 2002. A decision loss. And then a fight against Marvin the Beastman Eastman in WFA3. That's World Fighting Alliance in November 2002. He lost that one via KO in the first round. And it looks like Alex has the aforementioned Amir Ranavardi in his corner. Amir only had two fights in Pride. He played around with Gary Goodridge at Pride 3 and then lost to Sokun Ko at Pride, the best, Volume 1. Geezer tidbit, these two men share a common opponent. And in Pride, no less, that being Valid Ishmael. Akira TKO'd Valid at Pride 4 and Stiebling won via decision against him at Pride 19. That tells me Soji is going to win this fight. We see that a ref for this fight is Minoru Toyonaga. He once fought in Pride, least you forget. Time for the fight. Round one. The men test each other's supple inner thighs with kicks. Punches and clinch. Missed knee by Stiebling. The men trade, but neither with an advantage. Body blow here at Yokohama Arena. <laughs> and that was a body blow by Alex Stiebling. Alex playing cheeky with a shoulder fake to land a leg kick. He should have followed that up with a punch or two, though. Soji comes in for a punch. Stiebling ducks and grabs Soji, who reverses it and trips Stiebling down to the mat. Soji is in guard. Soji is pushed up to his feet. He gets stuck trying to spin over, but now is in half guard. Soji makes his move to pass, and he succeeds, getting into side guard. Boss licks his chops, fantasizing about how he would escape this position. This is, I have a very nice way to turn... Uh, Akira now on his back. <laughs> and that would be... Boss doesn't get to answer Quadros though as Soji gets a crucifix position, but it's brief and nothing comes of it. Soji makes his move to get out of this and he does it, getting Soji back into full guard. Five minutes down in round one, Soji's improved to half guard similar to the first time, but from his feet. Soji feeling a bit fresh as he breaks free and goes into... Mm, freaky mount. Oh yeah. And it's a good one. Stiebling works hard, though, and regains half guard. Our insipid commentators explain Alex's new nickname, the Fighting Al Bundy. Three minutes left in round one now. Not a ton of output from either men. Just as Quadros begins to tell a story about Stiebling being a jokester, business picks up briefly. Quadros never did stop telling the story during this entire time, though. Admitted jokester. And he said that he doesn't really think that people should follow in his footsteps. Nice kick to the head. Because he's sort of a crazy guy in and out of the ring. Soji back into crucifix position. He delivers some punches. One minute left now. Stiebling goes to escape. Soji tries to make him pay, but Stiebling pushes and gets up. Brief headlock. Stiebling to his feet. Out. Tries punches, then clinch into the ropes. And in the corner, the bell rings, ending round one. Not a great round, but Soji controlled the majority of it. Time for round two. General rule of thumb for kickboxers. Set up your kicks first with punches and have a follow-up ready. Otherwise, you are wide open to be countered. Soji seems to be a a little off after that last exchange though quadro starts referencing boss's mma workout video and nails it and he does that every day i imagine these numbers flying through my head right straight left hook right straight Ooh, left hook. what is he listening to me now they trade kicks 
And then they exchange, and out of nowhere, Soji clips Stiebling, who goes down. Soji all over him with punches, and Stiebling is a hair away from getting called out. Then Soji falls in the side guard, tries to keep up the attacks, but he is going to be gassed out here real fast. Soji then gets on the mount, wails away, but he's slowed down. Three minutes left in round two. Soji follows the full guard, and then Stiebling gets his second wind. Reverses. He's on top in mount. He wails down. Then Soji gives up his back. Stiebling decides to go for it. Rear naked choke. And though Soji is ready to tap, he doesn't. Stiebling Stiebling has lost the position here, really just a chin lock right now, and he gives up on it and goes back to punching. Stiebling postures up, delivers a few good rights, Soji looks out, and out of nowhere the bell rings, ending round two. Wow, what a great second half to that round. Soji definitely was saved by the bell. Another 15 seconds of that and it would have ended. And here's a better look at Soji clipping Stiebling. What a nice punch. And in honor of the clubbing good vibe, Woo! who does this corner man look like? Sean Aston. Let's see how this one ends on to round three. Alex is all backwards on his setup here. It's one, two, then kick. Nothing to really talk about so far. Stiebling is pawing at Soji, who is merely backing away. Little one, two from Stiebling. Stiebling counters here, but no follow up. Stiebling with a one, two, which Soji eventually answers with his own one, two. Two minutes remaining. Stiebling delivers this jab and kick. So far in this round, Soji has thrown about four punches. Stiebling has done all the work. Stiebling clocks Soji again. Lenny Hart calls for one minute left to get something brewing, and Soji takes a left to the face. Another one-two from Stiebling, but Soji finally answers with four punches. Stiebling gets a little lackadaisical here and pays for it, but his output is about ten times that of Soji. And the bell rings right here with our fight going the distance. Well, according to Punchtron 3000, the strike counting robot, the score in that round was Stiebling 71 thrown, 45 landed, Soji 10 thrown, 2 landed. I think it's clear Stiebling controlled the latter half of that fight. You have to give it to him, but this is in the past and I'm not here to judge. So let's head over to the center of the ring for our decision, which is... Alex! <laughs> Oh my lord, unbelievable, Akira Shoji has been awarded a split decision. What a travesty, Akira Soji, winner via split decision after three rounds. Funny story, that sentence I just read, I wrote that before I even watched the official verdict, and I was never spoiled on the results of this fight beforehand. It just goes to show, the pride judges will please the crowd before they ever please some gaijin with blue hair. Oh, Soji. Mr. Pride cries over his stunning victory. This is both heartwarming and completely pathetic. Soji, get a grip. But how could you not love the guy? Just listen to his blubbering. Steve, <laughs> Jill, and uh, that was it. I am. I am. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. That's gold, Jerry. <laughs> well this fight uh it was pretty good after the first round but the decision was completely uncalled for alex stiebling was outright robbed uh but what are you gonna do pride is ruled backstage by two competing yakuza gangs who actively bet on fights and there is no way the judges ain't in on that overall i give this fight a seven out of ten <laughs> Analysis, analysis, analysis with Alistair, with Alistair, with Alistair. Uh, next up, we have Alex Stiebling taking on Akira Soji. Uh, very slow start from the boys and very heavy top control from Shoji. That lulled me into a false sense of what this fight was going to be. I thought it was going to be a grapple fuck from Akira Soji. But then the second round happens and holy shit, the guys are just tearing lumps out of each other and both got super close to being finished. Um, I think Shoji could have had the fight if he had landed a couple more of those grounded knees, but that was not to be. Uh, goes to a split decision, which Shoji gets the nod in, and I don't agree with that. And if we're going by the Pride rules, which were effort to finish the fight by KO or submission, I believe Stiebling had Shoji closer to being finished than Shoji had Stiebling. Mm. So, uh, what can you do, though?
Uh, good fight, and but I guess that the pride judges are just the pride judges, and they're gonna be the way they're gonna be. So, what would become of our two big blubbering baby boxers here? Akira Soji will be back in Pride at Pride. Bushido won in October of 2003. Before then, he'll make a trip to America with a fight in Florida against who? Dustin Dennis. But we'll talk about that fight when we review Pride Bushido won. As for the Brazilian killer, Alex Stiebling, well, this was it for his Pride appearances. He only had four Pride fights going 2-2 two and two in total. After this, Stiebling would have 13 more fights, fighting up until 2009. Over those fights, he went 7-6. and six. He fought in the WEC a few times, with fights against Joe Riggs, a submission win, Chael Sonnen, a decision loss, Vernon Tiger White, a KO loss, and Jason Guida, a decision win. The final fight of his career was against one of the Brazilians of Shootbox in Brazil, with his Brazilian killer nickname contested once and for all against Ninja Hua. Well, Ninja would be crowned the Stiebling Killer as he TKO'd poor Alex after 39 seconds in the first round. Brazilian Killer no more. Alex was one of my boys, and I will deeply miss him. Happy trails, Alex, wherever you are. On to the third fight of Pride 25, which is a middleweight bout featuring two welterweights. It sees a returning Anderson Silva taking on a returning Carlos Newton. Silva was 27 years old for this bout, and his mixed martial arts record stood at 10-1. and one. As for Newton, he was 26 years old, and his record was 12-6. and six. Boss is backstage with Carlos Newton, who is all smiles already. Boss asks Newton, what his opinion of Anderson Silva is. Now listen, you picked quite an opponent. We got Anderson Silva. What is your opinion of Anderson Silva? Ah, uh, the guy's, uh, you know, he's one of the best fighters in the world in our division, so it's only appropriate, you know, I step up the bat. Uh, I've been looking forward to fighting him for a long time. And the whole time, Boss is either thinking of his grocery list or if he should pee before or after hitting a craft services table. Then Quadros is with Anderson Silva and asks, what does he think of Carlos Newton? In the pre-fight analyst, Quadros calls this fight a throwback to the early days of MMA with a grappler versus a striker. Uh, I don't really see it, but not so fast, says Boss. This striker, Silva, knows a lot of stuff on the ground and vice versa. Newton is improved on his feet. One more time with Anderson in the back, who thinks he's the Roy Jones of Valley Tudo. You told me once that you considered yourself to be the Roy Jones of Valley Tudo. Do you still think you are? This Anderson guy, he's going places. To the ring where, where Carlos Newton's entrance is in progress. He walks out to Alanis Morissette. It must be a Canadian thing. Silva was already in the ring and he's flanked by Vanderlei Silva in his corner. Newton, we haven't seen him in a while. I think he looks pretty good. We last saw Anderson Silva at Pride 22 in September of 2002, where he eked out a unanimous decision against Box of Rocks, Alexander Otska. As for Newton, it's been a little bit since we've seen his muscly body. That was back at Pride 19 in February of 2002, where he submitted Jose Landy Johns via... Armbar! Big height difference at the stare down. Newton is listed at 5'9 and Silva is listed at 6'2. That seems about right. Maybe about four or five difference to my eyes. Well, not much more to say. Time for the fight. Round one. Newton is the one striking. First with a locked jab and then is hooking left. Anderson slips and counters this. Very nice. Then tries another and Carlos dives for the left leg but hooks the body at the last second and gets Silva down. Newton works the body so Silva delivers some hoist Gracie upside down heel kicks. Newton bullies his way in a side mount. Newton needs and moves into a side north position, but Silva maintains wrist control. Silva's wrist control is tight and Newton floats over to the other side, but now in a half guard briefly and he's back to where he was in side mount, but again briefly as he decides to take mount. Newton makes space to punch Silva and it was pretty good. Newton delivers another solid shot, but it was a forearm. Not sure if that was legal. Newton diligent as I'm sure he's thinking, arm bar, just go for it now. Oh, I missed it. It was there. 
Now Newton's stuck in striking here, and Silva is escaping, but Newton hangs on for a Kimura, but he loses it. Ref stoppage to move the fighters, and Silva with a body triangle from the bottom. Boss mentions it and Silva's long legs. Quadros informs the viewer, Anderson and Vanderlei are not brothers, despite the same last name. There's Vanderlei Silva, the pride middleweight champion, giving instructions to his teammate Silva. Actually, they're not brothers, folks. Quadro says it's a lot like the name Jones in America. Boss says, or Smith, at least in Holland. Lots of Smiths in Holland. Silva is really aggravating Newton here. Hell, this is aggravating me. Quadros talks about the weight divisions and how there was no 185-pound division in Pride at that time. But if there was, these two men would be at the top fighting for the championship. Body body head from Newton, steady work from the top, but nothing to write home about. Anderson wrenches on his body triangle here, and there's five minutes down in round one. The ref is hovering, and he comes in to stand up the fighters, and whoa, Silva gets a yellow card. I don't like that at all. After the restart, Silva attacks. Newton way off the mark. Silva counters. Just as Quadros is done saying Newton is very relaxed, well, maybe he was a bit too relaxed as he didn't see this one coming. I think that would be a good idea, though. Oh! Newton is knocked silly. Silva gets on top of him, punches him a couple times, and the ref is in to stop the fight. Oh! No way! He's out! He's out! He's out! He's out! He's out. It was... Whoa! Whoa! It was not a good idea indeed. And just like that, Anderson Silva, winner via KO at 6 minutes and 26 seconds of the first round. The shoot box boys celebrate as Newton is still on the mat. Looks like his chin took the brunt of that knee. Youch! His jaw has to be hurting. And is that Anderson Silva's dad being hoisted up? Anderson then transforms into his Saiyan form, a low-rent Michael Jackson. And Newton is on his feet just in time to witness this. Hilarious. Great fight, very tense, and even the slowdown on the mat was interesting to watch. The knee of Silva was an early example of his striking cunningness, and Newton, who I'm sure had been working on his striking, just wasn't studied enough to realize the dangerous, unpredictable striker he was facing. I give this fight an 8 out of 10. E analysis. So deep with Alice. Next up, we had Carlos Newton taking on uh, Anderson Silva. Now, this isn't the unstoppable middleweight champion Anderson Silva that was around in, you know, 2012, around that period. This is early shootbox parody of Vandalay Silva, uh, Anderson, um, pressuring forward and failing to sprawl on takedowns. Uh, Carlos had some really good success early on with his takedowns and his top control, but he did get stalled out in Anderson Silva's guard. Uh, and after getting stalled out and stood up, he went to the well too often with those double legs and ate one of the most impressive sort of flying knees, one of those sort of important flying knees in uh, MMA history. So, what would become of our two extra crispy dark meat dukers here? Anderson Silva is back in quick fashion at Pride 26. Bad to the bone. Held in June of 2003. There he takes on loathsome cunt Daiju Takase. Yes, I am still pissed at Daiju over his fight with Manny Yarbrough. As for Newton, he'll be back at the first Bushido show in October. There he takes on a returning Henzo Gracie. See ya boys then. Fight number four is a welterweight bout, which sees the return of Hollywood Dan Henderson taking on a returning Shungo Oyama. Henderson was 32 years old for this fight, and his MMA record was 12-3. and three. As for Shungo, he was 29 years old, and his MMA record was 2-4. and four. Pre-fight, Quadros is interviewing Dan Henderson and talking about his last fight against the heavyweight champ, Rodrigo Nogueira. Dan says he's always here to do his best, no matter who it's against. He tries to better himself and never give up. Dangerous Dan Henderson, what can you tell us about him, boss? His name is Big Right Hand, and he's an unbelievable wrestler. That's what I can say about him. Thanks, boss. We're already in the ring, both men having entered, and this is it. Dan Henderson versus Shungo Oyama. Last time we saw Dan was at Pride 24 in the main event, where he was a short-notice replacement for Fedor against heavyweight Fucking champ Antonio Rodrigo Noguera. Dan lost in the third round via... Armbar! 
Jungo, meanwhile, was last seen in Pride at Pride 22, where he fought against High and Gracie and was submitted in the first round via... Armbar! Geezer tidbit time. These two men share two common opponents in Pride, Vanderlei Silva and Henzo Gracie. Henderson lost to Vanderlei via decision at Pride 12 and KO'd Henzo at Pride 13, while Oyama lost to Vanderlei at Pride 14 via TKO and defeated Henzo via decision at Pride 21. So it's a push, I guess, but we do know that Vanderlei must be better than Henzo by default. In the men's corners, we have an interesting matchup. I would have loved to see. Shuyoshi Kosaka is in Shungo's corner, while Randy Couture is in Henderson's corner. Hey, wait, these two did fight. That's right, my intrepid viewer. It was at Ring's King of Kings 2000 tournament in a quarterfinal matchup. Randy Couture took that one via decision, and he would go on to lose to Milk Dud Nipples Valentin Overeem later in the tournament, who he himself would go on to lose to Antonio Rodrigo Noguera, who won the whole shebang. So, who will win in this proxy battle of Kosaka versus Kator? Will it be the judo guy, Shungo, or the hard-hitting wrestler, Henderson? Let's find out. Round one. Dan with quick fire counter as Shungo kicks, and wow, Henderson is all over Shungo. Shungo got rocked, but he's still up somehow. No defense, though, from Shungo. He flops forward, still up, and now he's firing back. Wow, he looks okay. What a start to the round. Shungo cannot take him down. There's, the There's that right hand again. Doesn't look good, look good for Oyama. This could be a quick one, folks. Oyama's in a shootout for the wrong guy. There's a reaching kick from Henderson. Then there's the bread and butter kick plus Hendo Bomb. Funny to see that Henderson, even this early in his career, had already pocketed this combo into his tool belt, though it clearly needed work. Shungo moves in. Henderson kicks. Shungo throws some punches, backs Henderson up, who goes right back in in a clinch. Henderson clearly wasn't studied on this. Shungo with a judo hip toss, taking Dan down, then kneeing him on the way up. The crowd loves it. Dan dives in, but Shungo gets the better of him with two good straights. Dan with a loopy left clinch, outside trip, and Shungo is down. Henderson inside control. Not much work from Dan here, though. I guess Shungo is controlling his head, but eh, not really. Dan in tight side mount now. He elbows his side. Shungo bridges and rolls. Dan is up. Shungo rolls to get to his feet. Dan is all over him. Then they separate. Shungo then just casually watches as Henderson kaplows him right in the face. Body lock. Big takedown. Shungo is busted open. He covers up and Minoru Toriyonaga, our ref, is in to stop the fight. Really getting, oh, right head. And a takedown. The fight is and lifted. It's almost over, boss. It's almost over. There it is. It's it's over. Over. Whoa. Whoa. Great mess that was. Dan Henderson, winner via KO at three minutes. 27 seconds of the first round. Shungo is still on the mat. He'll be okay. Henderson goes over to get a high five from Alex Stiebling. What the hell is he doing here? Dan grabs a quick hug from the ring girl. Nice. Then he picks her up as his second trophy. Very slick. Quadro says he doesn't think she likes that. Boss says it's okay because it's the last time she's here. Ruthless. But I think, oh, there we go. He's going to do a hip slam on the ring girl. Uh, I don't think she wants yeah, that. Yeah, it's the last time that she's here anyway. Yeah, exactly. Shungo finally rises. It looks a little shaky. Boss gives him a lot of props, though, and so do I. He took a hendo bomb from a young Dan Henderson and lived to talk about it. Great fight! Shungo was game and anything could have happened, but Shungo clearly wasn't ready for Henderson's speed or power. He should have been trained to have his hands up all the time with this guy. It was almost as if he didn't know what could happen. I blame Kosaka, and I give this fight an 8 out of 10. Next up, we had Shungo Oyama taking on Dan Henderson. And Shungo Oyama is just a madman. He's there eating Dan Henderson's best shots and waiting for more to come on. Uh, very nice judo from Shungo, uh, rugging up Dan Henderson's takedowns. But once Dan got his wrestling going and started getting those takedowns, he broke free of Decision Dan and landed that enormous right hand. And a double leg up, that sort of body lock takedown afterwards, which was just the icing on the cake, just made uh, Shungo lose some more brain cells while he was being driven into the floor. Uh, Shungo was always way too tough for his own good. 
So what would become of our two cold caddy catch wrestlers here? Dan Henderson is back at Pride. Final Conflict 2003 in November of 2003 where he takes on Murillo Bustamante. As for Oyama, he'll be back for one more Pride event, but not until 2004. He returns at Pride Bushido 4 where he takes on... No. No, no, it can't be. Mirko Crow Cop? For the love of Pete, don't do it, Shungo. See you boys then. In this dressing room, fighters are preparing themselves for the fight. We will also see the cornermen and their trainers, and they will go mentally and physically at it. It's going to be very rare. This is a very rare occasion because nobody can enter the dressing room two hours before the fight. Let's go inside and have a look. Bam, bam, bam. How about that, Hansel? Oma Plata. Single leg takedown, Hansel. Huh? <laughs> Fly have knee. It, have it. What? Come oh, over oh here. no, no. Okay. Jump knee, Hansel. Watch it. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? We have here Hansel Crazy okay. and Steve. Knee bar, Hansel. Knee bar. Fighting video games. Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, Stephen, okay. Okay. Arm Stephen, Arm what are you playing here, man? Okay. No, no, boss. No, no, no. no. Okay. Go watch this, Hansel. 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 Get out of here, boys. Try to help your friend. I'm going to knock you out, Hansel. Okay, watch this. Get, get him out of here. Oh, no. Get him out of here. Yeah, punch. watch this, man. No, no. Punch. Liver punch. Who's no. your daddy? Who's oh, your daddy? Oh, man. man. What are you doing? Oh, man. Better look Gosh. next time. Bro. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let me there. Let me try. Let me try. Hold this. Hold this. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, Hansel, you want to play games? Say hello to my little friend. Okay, Stop praying. Stop praying. Come on. Okay, this is me. One thing. This is the guy coming at you. Punch, punch. Just no, no, relaxing. no, 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 no. You're finding the best what looking guy on? in this business. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm the With a little fanfare, we head straight into Fight 5 on the card, which I'm calling a welterweight bout, which sees a returning Kazushi Sakuraba taking on a returning Elvis Shembury. Sakuraba was 33 years old for this fight, and his MMA record was 14-5-1 and won no contest. Elvis Shembury, meanwhile, was 28 years old, and his MMA record was a scant 2-0. We get Sakuraba's entrance, and he gets a big ovation. He comes out to his Ridge Racer 2 techno music, wearing a traditional Japanese demon mask and he has a single nunchuck in his hand quadros mentions getting a complete discourse from his good friend dave Meltzer on what this mask means i'm sure that my friend dave Meltzer will give me a complete discourse on what this mask means because i have no idea we need a, it's like a little devil of course, Quadros and Meltzer were friends. They're both fucking tools. Sakuraba takes off his mask to reveal another mask, and he swings his little nunchuck around. It's all very precious. Then he pantomimes, ejaculating all over the crowd, and I guess the nunchuck swinging was a metaphor for him jacking off. Sakuraba has the boys of Takata Dojo with him, Matsui and Yamamoto. What a team. We last saw Sakuraba at Pride 23, where he squashed Giles Arsene, who decided to never fight again after that thumping. As for Shembury, he was last seen at Pride, the best, Volume 2, in July 2002, where he eked out a split decision against loathsome cunt Daiju Takase. He hasn't fought at all since then. Shembri is sporting some real thick Elvis-like chops, and he has Henzo in his corner. Sakuraba, meanwhile, has some writing on his heavily wrapped right leg. What does it say? No idea. At the stare down, we see Yuji Shimada wearing the patented Pride Ref Cam version 1 headset, so we'll get to see what he says. I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, time for the fight, round 1. Sakuraba opens with a high roundhouse. Shembri, for some reason, has his name tattooed on his back. Maybe he has low self-esteem and wants to make sure everybody knows what his name is. Sakuraba rages in with punches, but I don't think a single one connected. Low kick by Sakuraba. Shembri barrels in and Sakuraba tags him. Sakuraba moves in again and Shembri desperately tries to grab an arm while pulling guard, but he misses. Shembri is not looking good here. We get our first look at Ref Cam version 1, and it's a little janky. Sakuraba begins punishing the legs the crowd cheering with each one yeah because his last fight against Jill Arsene listen to this more ref cam version one and we see what the FPS view of a ref stand-up looks like 
In a man exchange, and Shembri gets a hold of Sakuraba, then pulls guard. Sakuraba deciding to carry him, and oh, Sakuraba's elbow has some blood on it. Sakuraba begins punching the side of Shembri, looking bored while he does it. Shembri slumping lower and lower now. Sakuraba wants a little more Shembri cocktail on him with a shoulder shrug. Shimada is in to break this up, and he wants to check that nose of Shembri. Uh, the schnoz is okay to go. A little bigger now, though. Big kick from Sakuraba. <laughs> What a shot! We get a shot of the bruised thigh just as Sakuraba comes in with a kick, followed by punches. Shembri falls right back up. Quadros and Boss have been blowing Sakuraba this whole fight, and Quadros shits a bit on Shembri. They're better. I think, I think this is the guy to practice stand-up on now. Because this guy, <laughs> this guy poses no threat standing who admittedly is standing like a punching dummy used for training. Sakuraba might be getting ahead of himself here. He shouldn't take Shembri so lightly. There's five minutes down in round one. Some toying here from Sakuraba as he pushes Shembri back and fires some punches. Shembri fires a punch and they exchange and Sakuraba keeps chasing. And I'm getting a sinking feeling here. Something's going to happen and it's not going to be good. Sakuraba does a double chop, then punches, clinch, and kapow! A knee by Shembri buckles Sakuraba. Sakuraba, he's down, another knee, and he's out cold. Shembri kicks, and Shimada finally in to stop the fight. Wow. But Elvis, oh, look at that. A double shooto. Oh, Sakuraba green. Being Sakuraba on the ground. Sakuraba's out. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Elvis Shembri silences the crowd. Unbelievable, but you could almost see this coming with Sakuraba's lack of respect. Antonio Elvis Shembri, winner via KO at 6 minutes and 7 seconds of the first round. This is bad, bad for Sakuraba State's boss. Hard to come back from this, and I have to agree, but I'll elaborate more later. Quadros, completely forgetting what he himself was saying the entire match, now says Sakuraba took this guy too lightly. Well, like, you know what? He took this guy way too lightly, and he, and he figured this guy had nothing, and this guy I'm just threw a knee. Yeah, and, oh, oh, good that the referee stepped in there. Huh? Quadros, you, you you were just shitting all over this guy moments ago. You can't have a change of heart now. Sakuraba still smiling, though, as he congratulates the victor, and Shembri celebrates one last time. Well, this fight. I feel strongly that Sakuraba was given no favors with this one, and what I mean by that is... This was obviously a gimme fight, set up by Pride officials because they wanted Sakuraba to have a big victory. Not only for him, not only for the Japanese audience, but maybe also to set up one more fight with Vanderlei Silva, which is what they wanted. And the Pride officials clearly didn't have faith that Sakuraba could do it against a like-skill caliber fighter. Maybe Sakuraba knew this. Maybe he was oblivious to it, but he was facing a mere student of a Gracie whom he had schooled on the ground prior, and this student had only two prior fights. He was clearly not as versed as his coach, and Sakuraba had to know that he would have very limited boxing and stand-up in general, which means that Sakuraba also had to know that it wasn't really a fair matchup. The fight turned out to be the burden of low expectations, and those expectations dictated Sakuraba's actions in the fight. Always take your opponent seriously, and if you think it will be a good show to stretch the fight out, not end it as soon as you can, well, you are giving your opponent that much more time to get one off, and Shambri got one off. I don't blame Sakuraba as much as I blame Price officials if they had more respect for sakuraba more faith then sakuraba should have been given an equal caliber opponent not some gracie lackey who only had two fights uh anyway my rant's over entertaining fight otherwise i give it a 7 out of 10 next up we have shembri taking on Kazushi Sakuraba, and this fight just made me sad. Uh, Saku did something that I once did, was he got so excited throwing punches at the other guy that he forgot anything could come back and just got brained by Nino Shembri, a man who could barely throw a punch. 
So what would become of our two low down dirty kickers here? Sakuraba will return at Pride. Total elimination 2003 and August 2003, where he has, yep, a third bout against Vanderlei Silva. Totally undeserved. As for Shembri, he'll be back at Pride 26, bad to the bone, in June, where he takes on a new and debuting Kazuhiro Hamanaka. We'll see you boys then. The sixth fight of Pride 25 is a middleweight bout featuring a returning Quentin Rampage Jackson taking on a returning Kevin the Monster Randleman. Rampage was 24 years old for this fight and his MMA record stood at 15 and 3. As for Randleman, he was 31 years old and his MMA record was 14 and 5. Pre-fight, Rampage is Interviewing Steven Quadros, pretty funny. All right, I'm here interviewing the famous Steven Quadros. He's a famous movie star and he's a good talker, man. This guy can talk, you know what I'm saying? Then Quadros asks him about the Quentin system. We're going to talk about the Quentin system today. Now, Quentin, what is the Quentin system? The Quentin system is kick some ass, you know what I'm saying? Train hard and kick that ass. Spank him like that, baby, you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. See, fight fans, it wasn't a system for dealing drugs. Then Quadros is towering over Randleman, who is hilariously listed officially at 5'10". Steven Quadros is also listed at 5'10". Hmm, something doesn't seem right here. There's about a four-inch size difference between the two men. So, my intrepid viewer, in reality, how tall is Randleman? Randleman says there's going to be a lot of thumping going on. I hope not. And it's not going to last 20 minutes. Certainly not. And either he or Quentin are going to be knocked out. Quadros is back with Rampage, and he says Randleman is cool with him because... He cool with me, you know what I'm saying? He a brother, I'm a brother. You know what I'm saying? I kind of don't like him being here because I thought I was a token black guy. You know what I'm saying? Rampage also says he wants Vanderlei. You know what I'm saying? Just be careful what you wish for. Then it's Boston Quadros with the breakdown of the fight. Quentin the Rampage Jackson says Quadros. Quentin the Rampage Jackson. He's a silly cracker. And for our breakdown, neither men are willing to give a prediction on a winner. Is that a new chain? Damn, man. No, man, I just glossed it up, man. What are you talking about? I keep my baby shiny, you know what I'm saying? This is a good, big fight for me, so I shine my baby up and he has a new chain. We get Rampage's walkout, and I think I hear someone in the crowd howling before he even comes out. Boss, this show so far has exceeded the expectations, but now I cannot picture how this fight could be any less. And I just have to say, pride with their Japanese sensibilities when it came to stage setup. The lowering walk weight is really awesome, but totally impractical. The famous Rampage scowl and how this type of fight energy is solely missing in today's MMA, but let's not talk about that. We last saw Randleman in the most recent Pride, Pride 24, where he was given a TKO victory over Ninja Hua due to a doctor stoppage from a cut. Meanwhile, Rampage was last spied at Pride 22 when he defeated Eagle Revolt Chanchion via TKO in the first round. Neither man has fought since those two bouts. Randleman curiously has Henzo Gracie in his corner, along with a not-so-curious Mark Coleman. Quadros even comments on this odd corner pairing. Kevin Randleman has a very dumb- Diverse uh, corner in Mark Coleman and Enzo Gracie. The men keep their distance at the stare down, and it's time for the fight. I'm ready. Are you? Round one. Before the bell even rings, Randleman is like a rocket out of the corner. Big swing by Randleman is ducked by Rampage, who takes him down very briefly. Randleman has the neck briefly, body clinch by Rampage. Shimada cam back in action. Knee by Rampage, then another. More knees. Even Randleman tries one. Randleman is pushing on Rampage in the corner, sapping his energy, but Rampage pushes out along the ropes. Back to the corner. The ref breaks it up. Big slugging left from Randleman. Rampage asks for more before delivering a straight right. One, two, three from Randleman with little effect. Reaching jab from Rampage. Randleman goes for the legs. Thinks of a pickup but loses it. Grapple against the ropes. Randleman breathing very hard. He pushes Rampage into the corner. 
Randleman looks panicked here and he eats a knee. Lethargic knee from Randleman and Shimada steps in. Randleman looks cooked. Leaping jab from Rampage. They collide, grapple, and Randleman pushes Rampage back toward the corner. Randleman pushes and eats a hard knee. Randleman tries to go low, but Rampage blocks and lifts and boom, hits a hard knee. Another two knees and a hooking right. Rampage chases. Randleman fires a shot that is ducked. Rampage fires a shot himself. Randleman tries a power double, but what defense from Rampage? Tense lockup in the corner. Randleman is trying to push and sap away Rampage's energy, but I think he's only sapping his own more. And Shimada is in again to separate the fighters. Big swing and miss from Randleman leads to another lockup. Two knees from Rampage and into the ropes. Back in the corner and Shimada is back in again to separate the men. Then a yellow card comes out. And hilarious reaction from Rampage as we see it from the Shimada cam. I laughed. He's on and then uh, it's very hard to stop him. Okay. Uh... Restart the men exchange straight lefts. With 10% of his purse already deducted, there is no way Rampage wants another lockup. So boom, he wrecks Randleman with a knee and then a right and left behind it. Randleman collapses, Rampage on top, ground and pound from Mount. Shimada in, the fight is over. Look how, uh... Oh! Quentin Rampage Jackson, winner via KO after 7 minutes and 15 seconds of the first round. Rampage celebrates, gets congratulated by Coleman and Randleman. Then we get a shot of his future opponent, Vanderlei Silva, who looks on, sitting next to ex-Yakuza mob man, and still behind the scenes Yakuza player, Hiromichi Mimose. Rampage is on the mic, and he gives some love to Randleman, then calls out Vanderlei, and Vanderlei comes in, and it's on, boys, it's on. Pandemonium in the ring breaks out, and that's how a championship fight is built. Wow, I'm excited. Oh, oh, wait, they change it, don't they? Never mind! <laughs> Okay, it's on. It's on, folks. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, folks. Welcome to the big league. Whoa! See what I mean? Rampage goes to leave, and now Vanderlei is on the mic. He's calling him out for a fight, and Rampage wants to go back in. But it's over for now. You'll have to tune in to Pride Final Conflict 2003 to see what will happen. Well, another stunning victory on this so far stunning card, but it was a lot more deliberate in getting there. Randleman wanted to use his pressure to drain away Rampage's energy, but it didn't really work. And in the end, it was the yellow card, the loss of 10% of his money that was the spark to give Rampage the motivation he needed to end the fight. That fool don't like losing money. I give this fight a 6 out of 10. <laughs> Oh, Next up, we have Rampage taking on Kevin Randleman. Uh, for those that don't know, and I don't feel like anybody watching this show wouldn't, Kevin Randleman could be so hot and cold. He'd uh, one day he'd knock out Crow Cop uh, off a fake takedown, and then other days he'd forget that he's in a fight, and he'd think that he could only wrestle. And the only way he could wrestle was try for those body lock takedowns. And he got frustrated, and he lost all confidence, and he wasn't putting on out any offense, and he just got the shit kicked out of him by Rampage just once he shut down. Uh, I did like how indignant uh, Rampage was when he got that uh, yellow card. That sort of shocked him into activity and made him uh, go after Randleman and beat the shit out of him. So, rough fight, but an exciting finish. So, what would become of our two big bad booty daddies here? Well, despite the winner of this fight get the next crack at Vanderlei, yoink, that shit is not happening. At least not right away. Rampage is going to pick up another fight for some quick cash and in short order as he returns at the next Pride, Bad to the Bone, in June of 2003, right near his birthday, where he will face a debuting Michaela Lukin, Russian, who is a former ring star with a record of 28-10-1. As for Randleman, he'll be back at pride 
total elimination in August 2003, where he takes on an also new and debuting Murillo Bustamante. See you boys then. It's main event time, a heavyweight championship bout that's also a top team clash as Russian top team fighter Fedor Emelianenko, 26 years old with a record of 12 and 1, takes on the reigning pride fighting championships heavyweight champion, Brazilian top team fighter Antonio Brofist Rodrigo Nogueira, who was also 26 years old and his record was 19, 1 and 1. Pre-fight, we get a compilation of Noguera victories leading up to the heavyweight belt. I guess he likes armbar. And then, what the hell is this visual? It's like an interview at a funeral. Noguera is very subdued. He says Fedor is a great fighter, but he thinks he has a little bit more technique. Later, Quadros asks if it's hard to get motivated to train, having fought so much. Noguera says, "See, si, senor. Very, I think it's more hard to get there." To stay there in the top, then get there, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have to ten, train twice than I was training before. Then we get Fader's compilation. No arm bars. Not as good. While Noguera towered over Quadros, Quadros is back with the height advantage. I think Quadros feels like he could take Fedor. Also, Fedor has a real shit-eating grin on his face. Quadros asks him what his opinion of Noguera is, and he gives him some short but sweet praise. Then Quadros and Boss break it down. Boss says Fedor is like a little pit bull, a wolverine, but Noguera is superhuman. Quadros says Noguera will want to take it to the ground, and Fedor wants to keep it standing. I don't know. I think that Noguera is going to probably take this fight to the ground because Fedor can really drop that right hand. Gee, thanks, fight professor. One more time with Fedor. If he wins, what is his future in pride? If you win the fight against Noguera, what does the future hold for you in pride? Я не знаю, это э, я думаю, об этом э, знают только представители Прайда. But Nogera gets the final word. Are you nervous about this fight? Yeah, I mean because this is a very important fight to me, you know. I get the belt, I have to hold the belt to me, to my country, you know. So I think uh, I took some some way in my shoulder to get the belt, you know. So a little bit more adrenaline. He's very good opponent, you know. For a while I didn't fight that any good guy like him, I guess. So it's a little bit adrenaline to me, but I'm I'm very confident. Kai Grant gets us hyped for the fight, and Kai Grant is the epitome of Japanese presentation. Fedor is coming out, and Quadros reiterates that this is not just the Pride Heavyweight Championship, but the World Mixed Martial Arts Championship. And he's right. There was no bigger fight in the mixed martial arts world at this time, and Pride would continue to be the premier promotion for about three years. And I'm going to go as far as to say this is the Pride Heavyweight Champion, but for all intents and purposes, this is the World Heavyweight Championship of mixed martial arts. It truly is. Fedor, very nonchalant, cold as ice. Quadros says Fedor comes in at 6'1", and I call bullshit. Quadros had about half an inch on him, at least, and I think we established that Quadros is 5'10". Then we get Noguera's walkout, and he still isn't coming out to give me shelter by Rolling Stones. What do you say about Minotauro? Minotauro is pretty much, in the last couple of years, running. He's been voted as the best fighter in the sport, both in 2001 2002 by most sports writers. Quadros sure does love him some Bob Sapp. He sings Bob Sapp's praises a few times here, despite the fact that Bob Sapp ain't nowhere to be seen. Literally. And beating Bob Sapp, and right now, nobody wants to fight Bob Sapp anymore. But the thing is, boss, he's been hit before, and he was hit by Bob Sapp. That's what I mean. And he could take a punch. Now, can Fedor punch more accurately that was the trick because Bob Sapp would hit him with a grazing shot which would basically put most mortal men in an unconscious stupor. Quadros calls this fight a dream and hints at certain fighters ducking fights and demanding too much money to step into the ring. Most of the time fighters in the sport are busy ducking each other. They're busy avoiding each other. They, they want so much money that they can't get in the ring because no promoter can afford it. Hmm, I wonder who he could be talking about. Quadros then wails like a banshee being penetrated. Let's get it on, folks. Woo! 
we get the national anthems of Russia and Brazil. Pride going all out to make this the big fight that it was. And Quadros, what a doof. And we're going to stand up for the uh, Russian national anthem, this being a title fight. It's like a rookie movie now. Uh, yeah. Are you going to put your hand over your heart? Oh, oh okay. Quadros asks if hearing the national anthem before a fight does anything to you. Boss gives us some insight. It does a lot to you. I always thought that it wouldn't do a lot for me, but uh, in all my title defenses, I had it too, and it, it is. It makes you, uh, yeah, it makes you different. During the Brazilian national anthem, Mario Sperry puts the belt on Nogueira, and Quadros calls this one of the greatest corners in MMA, Sperry, Bustamante, and Luis Alves. And then out of nowhere, Nobahiko Takata appears Surprise. to soak up some of the undeserved recognition. The famous pro wrestler and sports figure is going to dedicate. Where did he get this suit? Off the rack at J.C. Penny? No real clarification on what he says, other than that Takata made this fight officially for the Pride Heavyweight Championship, which he then yoinks from Nogueira. It's the closest he'll ever get to a real fighting belt. We last saw Fedor at Pride 23 in November 2002, where he defeated Heath Herring due to doctor stoppage after the first round. Nogueira, meanwhile, was at the last Pride, Pride 24, in December 2002, where he beat Dan Henderson in the third round via... Not much to say at the stare down. More Shimada cam coming our way though. Hopefully they fix the angle. Time for the fight. Reaching jab by Nogueira. Counter overhand left from Fedor. Nogueira shoots. Fedor sprawls. Nogueira stumbles. So does Fedor. He rolls. Nogueira up. Woo! That was close. Shotgun right from Fedor. They clinch. Fedor throws Nogueira through the ropes and clobbers him with a left. His wrist must have clipped Nogueira who tumbles. Pulls guard. Fedor postures up. Nogueira locks up the left leg. Fedor punches him with a hard left. Good wrist control from Nogueira. Fedor is pretty much free, but Nogueira wants to hold him close. Hey, it's not gay. It's a strategy. Fedor is once again free. Nogueira tries an up kick. Fedor tries to hurt him with the left. Quadro says Fedor may be the hardest arm puncher in history. Fedor Emelianenko may be the hardest arm puncher in history. Yes. In history. Take that, Abraham Lincoln. Fedor looking to get up now and woo. Nogueira just missed a scud missile there. Fedor reaches with some punches, but the sound of them. Oh, Babe Ruth right there. It, 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 was, it, was a, it was a strike. Oh, big, 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 big punches. And his cat-like moves. Then he knocks Nogueira with the last two. Fedor stuck between the knees of Nogueira, and apparently a bottle has been thrown at ringside. Quadros explains it that the crowd wants to see the fight, and when the photographers get up close, they block the action. That's actually pretty funny. He's just waiting. The crowd wants to see every moment of this. And when the photographers and the technicians at ringside got up close, some of the people in the crowd got a little hot because they want to see. Two body shots from Fedor. Shimada in to move the fires to the center. Nogueira gives a telling look. Nogueira tries to spring another armbar, but Fedor throws his legs off. Nogueira's tight wrist control leads to a Kimura attempt, but Fedor slips right out, and then uh, his fingers are stuck or something? Another big left from Fedor. There's already five minutes down in round one, and it's going by like lightning. Nogueira tries to lock up the right arm of Fedor, but then he gives up on it. After some punches, Nogueira focuses on the right arm again, but Fedor slips out. Then Fedor delivers two hard lefts. So far, Nogueira is being... <coughs> decimated on the ground improper use of decimated by the most dangerous man alive today welcome to body blow folks welcome to body blow folks someone get quadros his check fedor thinks of a big right then gets caught in a triangle but he slips right out wow the crowd is loving this unpredictable fight look at him block the arm oh Three minutes left, Fedor rocks Nogueira with the right, then more punches, and Nogueira is hanging by a thread. Another big shot from Fedor, and we're in the corner. The crowd is unsettled. They can feel the end is near. The people who want to see blood and violence. Oh, oh, oh big shots! Oh. Big shots! Fedor's all over Nogueira! All over him! He spent oh, big dude. time! Nogueira has never been in this kind of trouble, even with Bob Sapp. Quadros tells us that some people didn't believe Fedor could be a threat, but they were wrong, and Fedor, as if he was listening, puts an exclamation mark on that statement. Some so-called experts didn't want to admit that Fedor could be this kind of a threat. Oh, they didn't want to think that this guy with just the, just the victory over Heath Herring 
could really take away the championship belt. But, but we knew different. He is a threat. He's a big contract. Nogueira's in big trouble here. Also, props to Quadros. He had, and still to this day, one of the best calls of the action in MMA, at least when he's not trying to be snide or sarcastic. Quadro says if he were Fedor, he would stand up right now. Boss emphatically agrees. Then Quadro astutely sees that it's not just Fedor versus Noguera, but Russian Sambo versus Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or Russian top team versus Brazilian top team. Down to one minute now, and Fedor is pulled off balance, and Noguera is going to flip him. Noguera gets on top in half guard. Noguera slips out to side control, tries to trap the right arm, and whoop! Fedor flips Noguera. Unbelievable! <laughs> Noguera needs to really get busy. Look at this! Oh! Then Shimada cam time, just in time for the bell, ending round one. And what a round that was! Replay of the hard shots from Fedor. Boss wonders how Noguera can take these. Random crying Japanese who? Is she providing commentary? She has a headset on. This is weird. Time for round two. Noguera fakes and shoots, eats a knee, but is holding on. Fedor gets pulled out of the corner. Noguera tries for a double leg, but Fedor sprawls out. Noguera holds onto the leg, but Fedor spins. Noguera rolls onto his back. Fedor is on top and guard. Fedor clocks Noguera with a left. Dirty work in the guard here. Fedor keeps chipping away. Under the ropes now, and Shimada wants to reset the fight to the center. Fedor keeps up to punching, and though these aren't super clean, they are taking their toll. Fedor moves into a tall half mount. Noguera regains some control, but Fedor is loose, and then he's up. But he gets right back down and whacks Noguera. Noguera again. Three minutes down round two, Noguera thinks of an arm bar maybe? Arm bar! Hard right by Fedor, Noguera needs some aspirin. Noguera is now the underdog as the kind-hearted Japanese crowd begin chanting for him. Can you imagine the training you must have endured? I, 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 One minute left now in round two, another right from Fedor. Quadros tells us that Russian top team members have never defeated a Brazilian top team member. Is that true? Russian top team has never had one of their fighters defeat a Brazilian top team member. Fedor slugs Noguera again, who dislodges the Russian and rolls him to get on top, but the bell rings, ending round two. Quick round, this fight has flown by. Noguera looks beat up. Fedor looks nearly untouched. Time to put this one to bed. Third and final round, here we go. Right away, Fedor fires. The men collide and fall to the mat. Fedor in side control. Noguera regains guard, and Fedor continues to chip away at him. Noguera decides to roll. Fedor gets his leg and arm trapped, but he gets out. He tries to kick Noguera in the face, then he gets back in guard. Noguera with his head through the rope. Shimada back in to reset the fight. Fedor clubs Noguera with the left, then another and another. Noguera pulls him over. Fedor is up, kicks, and gets back in the guard. Noguera tries an up kick, then tries to get his legs around Fedor, but nothing comes of it. These fucking guys are back in the rope, so Shimada comes in again. Three minutes down in round three now, and this fight has slowed to a crawl. Back to the ropes they go! Fedor gets in a hammer fist. One minute left now, and it looks like both men are just out of gas. And now 30 seconds left. Fedor gets off two punches, and the bell rings here in the corner. Noguera bloody and beaten. Fedor helps him up. Noguera falls to his knees. He knows he's lost. He gets help to his feet by Arona. Maybe Quadros lets slip who wouldn't take the fight with Fedor as he overtly calls Fedor the real smashing machine as opposed to Mark Kerr, who will always be my smashing machine, by the way. This guy, Fedor, is the real smashing machine. <laughs> the real deal. The real deal smashing machine coming at you, folks. Did Mark Kerr duck a fight with Fedor? Time to head over to the judges to learn the result of our fight, which is... Clint Eastwood. Did I fire five shots Jackie or only Buckle. six, but I kind of lost track. He has done it! He has done it! Fedor Emelianenko, winner via unanimous decision after three rounds. The streamers come down. Fedor thanks Noguera. We get a shot of unknown crying Japanese woman again. Who the hell is this woman? Then Quadros tells us that this is the best Pride Fighting Championship show we have ever seen. Mm, maybe. Boss agrees, though. Well, what was he going to say? No? <laughs> Then that snake Takata sneaks back Trash. in the ring to give Fedor his new heavyweight title. Forces Fedor to shake his hand. What a loser. Also, Quadros promotes a non-existent Vanderlei vs. Rampage fight in June at Bad to the Bone. Well, that's a shame. Maybe at Bad to the Bone we'll find out why that fight didn't actually happen. And that does it for this one. 
end our event. Well, this was a good fight without a good ending. Look, I understand that it was a war of attrition, and Fader had to be wary of the submissions, but he had Noguera on Queer Street several times. He could have easily stood up, kicked and stomped, and finished this fight. I guess he wanted to win it where no one thought he could, in the guard of one of the best BJJ fighters ever. Give him props for that. I just would have liked to see a finish. Overall, I give this fight an 8 out of 10. Deep analysis. Oh yeah, right there. With Alistair. Next up, we have our main event of the evening. That is Fedor and Melianenko taking on Big Nog. So both Nagira brothers in action tonight. Uh, this is definitely a turning point in both Big Nog's and Fedor and Melianenko's career. Uh, Big Nog, like, never looked like the young, active man ever again. When he walked into this fight, he looked young and handsome. And then every fight after this one, he looked 10 years older. And we saw him have that age beaten into him by uh, Fedor in this fight. Also really interesting to see Fedor cement himself as the best in the world at the time. Not through a dominant finish, not through a submission, but by completely shutting out uh, Big Nagira. So, and doing that in an exciting and ruthless way, just beating Nagira's ass. Uh, great fight. So, what would become of our two big titty title fighters here? Fedor returns to Pride first at Pride 26, held on June 8th, 2003, where he takes on a returning Kazuyuki Fujita in a non-title bout. Why? But between then and Pride 25, he would return to the Rings organization for a singular bout in Rings Lithuania, Bushido Ring 7, where he takes on a Lithuanian of all things, one named Egidius Valavisius. What a fucking name. As for Nogara, he'll be back at Pride. Total Elimination! 2003 in August, where he takes on a returning Rico Rodriguez, who hasn't been seen in Pride since Pride 12. We'll see you boys then. It's time for the real main event of Pride 25, Body Blow, Alexander Atsuka versus Kenichi Yamamoto. Alexander Atsuka, glistening golden boy, was 31 years old here, and his MMA record was, uh, let's not talk about that. As for Kenichi Yamamoto, he was 26 years old, and his record was 4, 5, and 2. Big thanks to both Alistair and my special Russian friend Zoro for getting me this fight. Alistair had sent me the fight, but something happened with the file I had, and in a pinch, Zoro got me the hookup. Thanks, bros. I love you both. This was actually the third match of the event, and we get Alexander Otsuka's walkout. He comes out to some Japanese power rock ballad. Cheers. Some of the crowd claps with the song, and then maybe I think some in the crowd sing with it. It's hilarious how big of a deal Alexander is making his walkout. It's like he's the champion. Well, he is the champion of our hearts. Then it's Kenichi's turn to walk out. A little less fanfare and also a more hammy Japanese rock song. Quadro says Kenichi said he was under a lot of pressure because he lost his last two fights. Quadros then says it's true for Atsuka too since he lost um, just about every fight. We last saw Atsuka at Pride 24, where he lost, of course, to another Yamamoto, Yoshihisa Yamamoto. He hurt his knee and a doctor stopped the fight. What an embarrassing result. As for Kenichi, he was last at Pride 23, his debut for the promotion, where he lost to Kevin Randleman via TKO due to knees in the third round. Alexander has on an Alex Zero shirt. No idea what that implies. And what the fuck tattoo is that on Kenichi's arm? It looks like a combination of the Goomba from that terrible Super Mario Brothers movie crossed with uh, a walnut shell. It has to be one of the unsightliest tattoos I've ever seen in my life. Quadros tells us that Yamamoto went into the woods and did a lot of wood chopping for training. Kenichi Yamamoto said that he went up into the mountains and did a lot of wood chopping 
As a matter of fact, he did so much that he said that his right arm got stronger than his left. Ah, ha, ha. Very funny, Quadros. Wood chopping. We get it. Geezer tidbit. Atsuka was born in June, as well as his opponent, Kenichi. And did you know here at Pride 25, there were six fighters born in June? That includes the Noguera brothers, June 2nd, Elvis Shembri, June 1st, and Quentin Rampage Jackson, June 20th. What does that mean? I don't know! Time for the fight, round one. Quadros mentions how we've seen Atsuka with tape all over his body, and tonight he has his knee and toes taped up. Atsuka delivers a cheeky uppercut cross and then a loopy right right behind it. Now clinched in a the corner, they jostle a little. Yamamoto tries an inside trip, but it didn't work. Yamamoto delivers a knee that Atsuka reacts to, then he goes for another knee. But Atsuka catches that one and picks Yamamoto up and slams him down. And there he goes. Well, that didn't work. Crowd liked it, though. Quentin Jackson there. Jump and the defense by Yamamoto on the bottom. Yamamoto now has the guard. Atsuka tries a can opener, but it doesn't really open anything. It's kind of funny. Hey, why isn't this working? Atsuka keeps trying, though, and he nearly falls into an arm bar. Well, at least that can opener spot is over now. Effortless roll here by Yamamoto, as Atsuka seems to help the cause by rolling himself. Now, Yamamoto tries a can opener. This is so silly. I don't know if these guys are working, but I get the feeling that they are. Yamamoto in a half side guard here, and Atsuka begins his silly slaps, and he straight up slaps him in the back of the head. He gets admonished by the ref and apologizes with a gentle stroke on Yamamoto's back. What a sweetheart. Palm strikes now from Atsuka. To the body. More varied attacks from the bottom. Atsuka always coming up with new ineffective strikes each and every fight. Also, the crowd laughs about something some jag off in the crowd shouts. And the audience found something humorous. Quadros complains about the lack of a stand-up, wondering where the referee is. Then Boss complains when the ref comes in to only reposition them. And then Atsuka fixes his fucking knee guard! Mezgar! Five minutes down now, Yamamoto gets wily and tries a knee bar, but Atsuka slinks away, and then Yamamoto grabs him right by the ass. So Atsuka tries to whack him. It's like a scene out of a prison movie. Atsuka turns out of it, grabs Yamamoto by the neck, and holds on. Quadro says of Atsuka, he's doing really well, actually. He's doing really well, actually. If you say so, Quadros. Yamamoto gets to his knees, drives for a leg, so Atsuka grabs him by the dick and does a... The, Tombstone pile driver! Tombstone pile driver! Diving low for a single. And oh! Yamamoto rolls to get guard and eats some shots as he does so. Quadros had mentioned earlier in the bout that these two are friends and now says that they assured him, even though they are friendly, that they wouldn't take it easy on each other. They assured us that uh, because they had uh, good feelings towards each other, that they wouldn't take it easy in the match. That they would uh, really make it exciting because they both said that they both come in head on. I'm not so certain. I still think they are working a bit. Ref comes in to reposition the fighters, and Atsuka needs a bit of help getting up. There's now three minutes left in round one. Quadros is bored and asks Boss what he's been up to. Boss shills for some scooter website or something. So, uh, what have you been up to lately, Boss? Meet man. Listen, um, I have this new little toy. It's an electric scooter. Goes 40 miles an hour. Can you believe that? You can check it out. Betsy.com. Go. Atsuka has very loose control, and Yamamoto casually just tries to sweep him, but it doesn't work. And there's one minute left now, so the ref calls for action. Hey, ref, how about you stand them up and give them guns? That'll be some action. Atsuka does an elbow to the tit, and Yamamoto complains to the ref. Atsuka gets warned. He apologizes, and Yamamoto strokes his head. It's all very sweet. Quadros calls this a sparring match. Boss agrees and says that's why we need a restart. But no restart comes and the bell rings ending round one. Well, that round mostly sucked. Yamamoto gets carried like a child to his corner. He even kicks his legs like he's having a tantrum. I'm over this fight already, so let's jump into round two. The men trade. Nice uppercut by Atsuka. Yamamoto falls the pool guard, I guess. Atsuka whacks him with a couple good shots, and then, and then he's in guard. What the fuck is Yamamoto doing? He's not serious with these punches, is he? Boss mentions how he saw Quadros in a movie called Cradle to the Grave. Quadros, maybe he's putting us on, but he couldn't sound less interested in the topic. Yeah, with, with Jet Li and DMX? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Warner Brothers in the theaters now. We finally get a restart. Oh, 
no, I take that back. It's a reposition. Come on, really? Body, body, head from Quadros. He needs to do a lot more of that. Yamamoto really isn't doing anything from ground. Then Asuka tries a double chop. It didn't work. Now in a side mount position, Asuka attempts to work some striking. A hammer fist, a knee, a punch to the body. Then he does this knee splash, which is a move my six-year-old son used to do to me when we would play wrestle. Yamamoto should get a yellow card here. He's done absolutely nothing. Asuka is suddenly inspired now, delivering more knees at the three-minute mark, but Yamamoto manages to turn out of it to get to his knees. Then Yamamoto stands up. Asuka, that dummy, throws a head kick and misses, and now they are back to standing. Late kick by Yamamoto, and he is blown up, completely gassed out. But he throws another and that one hurt Asuka. One minute left now and Asuka shocks me with one of the most awful punches I've ever seen. I'm not sure what Asuka's intent was with that punch, but it definitely wasn't to hit anything. Yeah, both these guys are gassed. This is not what we want to see at the end of the round. And suddenly it's like Don Fry versus Takayama, just way shittier. Yamamoto's punches are akin to a clawless cat batting at you. And then the bell rings, ending the round. Well, another crap round in the bag. Here I am, thinking I'm a funny guy. Make this the main event of the episode. <laughs> Serves me right. Round three. Yamamoto starts with the late kick. Atsuka is toying with a bad uppercut and Yamamoto counters with another late kick. Atsuka goes for the hips and he drags Yamamoto down. Um, these guys aren't very personal, boss. Yamamoto traps the right arm and sweeps Atsuka over. Yamamoto is on top in mount, but he's bewildered and confused and he fucks it up. Yamamoto, what are you doing? Fuck you. And Atsuka wins via decision. Viewers, I just saved you and me a lot of frustration. Nothing happened. It's better to just end it right now. Well, this fight was truly one for the ages, or one for the toilet. It sucked. One of the worst fights in Pride. It's not as bad as, say, Hoyler Gracie versus Yuhi Sano, or Severn versus Kimo, but it's pretty close. Actually, I think I enjoyed Gracie versus Sano more because it was a better fight to shit on and make fun of. At least it provided some laughs. This fight, hmm, besides the Tombstone pile driver, was barren of any enjoyment. I give it a 2 out of 10. <laughs> Deep Analysis with Alistair. Finally, we have our surprise match of the night, not on the American DVD. That is Keiichi Yamamoto taking on Alexander Otsuka. Uh, two of our shoot style boys, Battle Arts vs. Kingdom, PWFG vs. UWFI, Fujiwara trained vs. Takada and Robinson trained. And... As often happens when guys trained in that lineage meet under MMA rules, it was kind of tentative from both of them. It looked like a sparring match. Now, don't get me wrong, there were moments of excitement. We had Yamamoto going really hard for that knee bar. We had Otsuka hitting a shoot pile driver and going for his drop kicks. But it never really felt like the boys let themselves go and, and went all out on offense. And boo to Keiichi Yamamoto getting his uh, kingdom pro wrestling tattoo that he used to have on his arm covered up. Really uh, poor, poor form by that guy. You, you get a tattoo of a uh, wrestling promotion that only lasts one year. You should wear that for the rest of your life. So what would become of our two true main eventos here? Kenichi Yamamoto returns at Pride. Bushido 4 more than a year later in July of 2004, which will mark his last Pride appearance. Between then and Pride 25 here, he will not have another MMA fight at all. As for the Diet Butcher, God love him, he returns for just one more Pride event. Pride 27, Inferno, in February 2004. There, he takes on Ninja Hua in his farewell belt. It'll be a sad day for sure. Then again, maybe not. See you boys then! Well, that will do it for Pride 25. Overall, it was a very good show. The DVD made the show a bit better than it was, at least in the omission of Atsuka versus Yamamoto. But cutting out a lot of the walkouts and the Parade of Fighters kind of offset that. But the fights were good, except for, you know, which one. Overall, I give this event an 8 out of 10. Now it's time in the show where I pick the fight of the night, which is... Henderson versus Shungo. Now, now, you might say Nogera versus Fedor was better, a certified classic, and I think it was fight of the year, and I can't argue with that, but I like me some Dan Henderson. And with that, we come to the end of another episode. Wow, what a show, the best yet.
One day, I will be back for more Pride action whenever I get around to reviewing Pride 26, Bad to the Bone. But just what is in store for us with that show? Held on June 8, 2003 at the Yokohama Arena in Yokohama, Japan, Pride 26 features seven bouts of bad bony action, starting out with a debuting Kazuhiro Hamanaka taking on a returning Elvis Shembri. Anderson Silva is back to take on loathsome cunt Daiju Takase. Alistair Overeem returns to take on unknown Mike Bensick. Rampage Jackson is, of course, back too, gypped from his title bout and instead taking on venerable Russian Mikhail Alukin, Russian no-holds-barred fighting network rings veteran. Don Fry marks his return to welcome back Mark the Hammer Coleman in a UFC Finals matchup. Mirko Krokop is back to take on Heath Herring, and in our main event, Kazuyuki Fujita marks his return to take on the newly minted Pride Heavyweight Champ Fedor in a non-title bout. Kind of weird. Overall, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Be sure not to miss it. But until then, friends, I must bid you adieu. So, for the Colombian good vibe, Woo! Alistair, and all the loved ones around the world, I am the most dangerous man alive today. Wishing you goodbye, good luck, and we'll sniff you fucking jerks later. ただいまよりお花見ます。